uh, knowing to, how to navigate a hallway, how to self breach or how to get someone else to breach, which side of the door to stand on. You don't have to be a super duper expert, but understanding the basic principles behind a lot of that stuff will take so much of the guesswork out of a real life encounter. And it'll take so much of the thinking out of your real life encounter that it'll, it'll allow you to focus on things that are much more important. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Okay, let's start with some quick housekeeping up front. Uh, Not too long, I promise. So first up, which we often fuck up, but we try, um, what we're drinking. So it's just me, Pat, tonight. Um, I have some Crown Royal maple mixed with some delicious ginger ale. And uh, to be honest, you don't even need the ginger ale. It's like drinking maple syrup, and it's delicious. So I'm glad we got that out of the way. Take a quick sip. Hold on. Okay, I'm sure you heard our disclaimer. We use adult language. We make adult jokes. We talk about adult references. Uh, That's really important here. That allows us to speak however we like so that we can convey the most information to you guys without having to worry about red tape. Uh, So tonight I can't cover everything. There's going to be some stuff I miss. Um, I'm obviously not going to get way in-depth in advanced SWAT topics, Um, but I think there's going to be a wealth of information regardless. Um, Also, some of you might know that occasionally, uh, like we just interviewed uh, Rayford Davis last week, fantastic dude. Um, I am not anti-cop. I'm also not blindly pro-cop. So whatever your political opinions are, uh, like I said last week with Rayford, whatever your political opinions are about law enforcement and government, police are in a position where they can do a lot of good, where they they have a lot of access and they have a lot of um, resources to accomplish some really interesting missions to help people. So I'm going to keep my politics to a minimum today, and we're going to talk about SWAT and CQC and CQB and all that stuff. Um, And another last point of housekeeping, I love the um, audience interaction. So if you have something you want to comment about today's episode, sorry, I'm a little stuttery. I haven't been drinking a lot lately. I'm kind of a lightweight tonight. Uh, If you have a comment about tonight's episode, some of the best ways to get a hold of me um, are not YouTube comments. I don't get on there a ton. I just don't find the platform very conducive to easy commenting. Um, I am on Instagram every single day. I'm also on Discord almost 24-7. So if you want to link to our Discord channel, that will be in the show notes today. Check out the source document for our website. It's uh, uncensoredtactical.com and just click on the episode. And you will find at the bottom of the page a link for our Discord. Or you can email me at uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. I check that almost every day or every other day. All right. So let's jump into the topic. SWAT. So for the purpose of today's episode, the terms SWAT, S-W-A-T, and C-Q-C, as well as the acronym C-Q-B, they're, for today, they're all going to mean the same thing. It's just SRT, um, all these different acronyms. It's just a special team that uses special weapons, nothing crazy. So let's talk about the difference between the three or four acronyms I just listed. Uh, SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics. Um, I don't want to do it a disservice, so let me give a blanket statement up front. I'm going to put the link to the other article I did, a review on, uh, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, Radley Balco. He did a book called Rise of the Warrior Cop goes in great depth, has some great history. Uh, If you're in law enforcement and you're reading it, it might look like there's an anti-cop bend to it, Um, but the information is fantastic. Um, So check out that book for some great history and insight into modern policing. It also talks about historical policing and how policing came to be. It also talks about the formation of SWAT teams, so I don't want to do it uh, an injustice, but uh, let's talk about the acronym SWAT, S-W-A-T, Special Weapons and Tactics. A lot of people thought that was too military, so they changed it to special, Specialized Weapons and Training. And there's there's actually a couple different acronyms that that's supposed to represent now. Um, a lot of agencies actually started getting away from that probably around the 2000s, uh, and they started using terms like SRT, Special Response Team, so it's less scary. Do the same fucking thing. Um, however, some agencies will use SRT. Um, I know the agency I used to work for 
we had a SWAT team and we had a uh, SRT. We had both. And one was what you think of when you see the movies, like SWAT. Uh, and the other one, SRT, if I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, was a um, kind of like a anti-riot response. Or I think specifically they would respond to our jail because we did both, uh, you know, road patrol. And we also handled the jail at our county county level. Uh for the most part, for today, all these acronyms are going to mean the same thing. I'll probably just stick with saying SWAT. Uh, CQC is close quarters combat, and just like SWAT, it often refers only to room clearing and shooting. And then there's close quarters battle, which in my experience has a military lean or slant to it. So often the military will say close quarters battle. So for the most part, the curriculum is the same. They clear rooms and they do some shooting uh, and team movements. Um, but in the military version, uh, they often do things like mount M O U T or militarized, uh, operations in urban terrain or something, something similar to that. Uh, I've done some of that training. It's now it's walking down the street with buildings on both sides and how to respond to ambushes and how to get into a house and how to flank and move around houses. And for the most part, there is so much overlap in all of these things. So to hammer this dead horse, we're going to say we're sticking with SWAT for the acronym of the night. Uh, let's get into a little bit of disclosure about my experience. Um, when I was on my counter drug team for the Coast Guard, uh, I attended something called BTOC or BTOC, we called it. The name changed several times throughout my career and then after. Um, it was seven weeks of SWAT training at Camp Lejeune with, uh, it was on a Marine Corps base, but we were taught by, uh, we were taught by Navy SEALs, we were taught by Army Rangers. Um, I've heard that Delta doesn't exist, but I, may or may not have met a Delta operator or two as an instructor and a trainer. We had some, I don't know if I said contractors already, but several contractors from overseas that were very active. Um, one of the, Short side note, one of the problems that we had was our instructors were limited to only teaching us our curriculum. So this was a very common phrase in our the SWAT school that I attended for seven weeks there. They would say, here's what we're supposed to teach you unrelated hey there's this thing that might really work in the field so you know some some type of phrase kind of like that we'd hear that almost daily um, they'd say this isn't very smart but we're supposed to teach you it you know it's up to you what you do in the field and you're responsible for your actions but you know this also might be a better option but it's not in the curriculum so you know we're not teaching it to you we're just showing you Again, another another limit of bureaucracy which is why one of my main missions of this website and this podcast to tell you guys the truth about what happens behind the scenes. And so much of that is about bureaucracy too. That's a common theme here. Okay. So I attended seven weeks of SWAT, uh, paid for by the coast guard. It was on a Marine base and it was taught by some very active people from all over. Uh, I have attended several different collateral skill set schools, uh, like your TAC med. So like kind of like your SWAT medic type school, uh, some live tissue medical training that focused a little bit on tactics. I've done an expeditionary combat school. Sounds cool, right? Uh, that's a very uh, kind of field unit type training, like walking through the woods um, and planning out flanks and bounding and leaping and all that shit. I've attended at least one or two of those. I did Blackwater's, well, if, if you remember that company, back when it was still Blackwater, I did one of their counter ambush kind of training schools with convoy training and ambush training. Uh, I did a stand-up, three-week, get-my-ass-kicked SWAT team startup at my unit. Uh, so it was three weeks of waking up early, going to bed late, staying up all night, throwing your gear on at 2 a.m. and doing a team run and then doing simunitions training in all sorts of abandoned buildings and warehouses and mental hospitals. Uh, lots of force on force, lots of simunitions. We're going to talk about that later in the episode. Uh, I'd, and the whole time that I was at that counter drug unit, we did several, I don't know if it was quarterly or three times a year or twice a year, but, um, several times a year I did just a week long of nothing but SWAT training with some very, very effective instructors, um, that were active in the field. Uh, so I don't want to go too deep on it and, you know, cry me a river, but, uh, Coast Guard gets a lot of heat for being, uh, you know, nobodies <laughs> and wearing their little orange life vests. Um, but a very small percentage of the Coast Guard, they're very active. They get very highly trained and they're very professional and very good at what they do. Um, I think we were overtrained for our mission. I loved the training, but I still, I mean, we were highly, highly trained. Um, I also did local law enforcement and I took a, 
a lot of that wealth of information with me uh, to the local level and apply that with one man or two man or you know three man operations and just so much of that training even to prevent something from happening just to take a good position to make people not want to you know second guess themselves a lot of that training definitely saved my life a few times um okay so got all that out of the way that is a rough just a rough touch of some of my experience and some of my training not to mention you should be weighing the content over the qualifications because this is another common phrase you'll hear me say titles and qualifications don't mean shit even for me yes and even for you um there are other operators out there that have the same qualifications as me that are sharper than me and are you know trained a little harder or still actively train harder or that are still active in that environment sure um I was very good. I was I took a lot of passion with my training, but yeah, there was one or two guys that were better shots than me or one or two guys that were better multitaskers or sure, pick a topic. There were also guys with the same qualifications as me. They couldn't tie their fucking shoes. So, uh, <laughs> I, it's kind of hard to tell some of these stories without diamond people out. And that's not my, it's not completely my style. Um, there were people that I've been in shoot houses with that I feared for my life that were on my team. Not a lot. Uh, most of the guys on my in my actual unit were very, very sharp. Um, some of the guys in the, in the agencies or the units or the teams that we worked with were embarrassingly not good at what they do. But just to beat this dead horse, uh, titles don't mean shit. So again, please judge the content of my show tonight and not my qualifications. Uh... So this is kind of going to, section two here, this is kind of going to be the body of the show. So it's going to be one part, what is a squat school like? And we're going to kind of mix in some how does this apply statements. Uh, So, next segment. First up, what is a squat school like? Almost every kind of SWAT or CQC training that people have the opportunity to attend one of the biggest portions that a lot of people just love. Oh my God. Hey, can you tell me about the training? How do I get ready? Uh, it's a physical fitness, not so much physical fitness as getting your ass kicked, uh, with PT or, or with physical training. Um, I've been told over and over and over again, it's to weed out the people that don't have the winning mindset. It's to weed out the people that aren't physically prepared um, it's to kind of get the only the strong survive thing going so that towards the middle and the end of the course, when you start learning the actual content, why would we waste our time teaching you how to shoot and move if by the end of it, you're just going to quit when the going gets tough? That's what I've been told. Here's the problem. There's some people that are military, some people that go from unit to unit in the military. There's some people that go from military to civilian. There's some people that go from civilian to other agencies that have gotten their ass kicked over and over and over again in training. And it's kind of unnecessary at a certain point. So there are some training centers out there that they kind of wave that physical fitness part and they say, okay, welcome. I'm going to treat you like a peer and a professional. And we're going to talk about these tactics and we're going to train you. I found that I really thrive in that environment. I just, I just thought that getting your ass kicked for no reason was kind of a waste. Some people say there's a reason for that. Yes, I agree. But you know, there's my thoughts on that. So what is SWAT school like? Step one, very large chance you're going to get your ass kicked physically day in and day out. So uh, here's kind of a big compliment I want to give to civilians. When you're in law enforcement, not every day of your job, but if you're doing special training, uh, and when you're in the military, um, you have, in both of these fields, you have a lot of time often, not every time, but you have a lot of time for the most part to do nothing but train and nothing but work out. And you're doing it on someone else's dollar. Um, sure, it's impressive what some military guys can do. But my thoughts are, I can take 10 random guys off the street, and if all I did all day for them, I fed them, I clothed them, I gave them a bed to sleep in, I took care of all that, and I was in charge of training them, or anybody, you can produce such great results if it's your full-time job to train. So for the people that are civilians that, that do a lot of shooting, they do a lot of research, they listen to a lot of professional podcasts on the topic um they pay their own money to take their own vacation time to go attend schools like uh uh, where to go gorilla approach 
uh, with Aaron. Um, I know he does a lot of civilian classes, some of these other guys out there. Um, I am so, so proud of and so impressed by the civilians out there that work their fucking asses off and scrap just to get these quali- these these uh, these skills and to really impart those skills on themselves. That's impressive to me is when a civilian puts the time and effort in to really sharpen the skill set. It's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Um, so I think that's impressive. So round of applause for you guys. All right, so getting your ass kicked at SWAT school is usually the first step. Um, let's move on to not really being able to do anything until you know how to... Uh, well, these two things can happen in either one first and then the other. You can kind of reverse them either way. But uh, often you'll do a lot of shooting. And it's not necessarily room clearing, but it's what uh, a term that you'll hear a lot in this environment is running your gun. Learn how to run your gun. Um, basic weapon handling, basic firing, basic reloads, knowing how to handle misfires, uh, learning how to do weapons transitions. So all that stuff, you hammer it and hammer it and hammer it so that when you're in an environment with high stress, that stuff is second nature. So if you go, if you pull a trigger, then the gun goes click instead of bang, you don't have to sit there and hold the gun up and look at it and go, huh, oh shit, I'm dead. So you got to learn how to run your gun. That takes a lot of ammo downrange. It takes a lot of repetitions. Um, so step one, get your ass kicked. Step two, learn how to run your gun. That's often what most SWAT schools will do. Um, because believe it or not, most street level cops and most infantry level let me back up before I dig a hole for myself. Most street level cops, yes. Um, a lot of military people that aren't in an active war fighting environment. Um, so these two groups often are very poor with their gun running, with how to work their guns, how to handle their misfires to the point where it's second nature. Um, Yes, police go to a police academy. Yes, they're taught a super duper minimum of, well, if you get a stovepipe, uh, this is your, this is what you're going to do. Uh, they're not getting 10,000 repetitions. They're not doing it so that it's second nature. They're just qualifying. Uh, they're, you know, and here's the exception. Some cops do a lot on their own to train. Some cops come from the military or special units. Um, some military guys that are at that basic level go out and get their own training from civilians. Hey, big surprise, right? Because military people are special and cops are special. No, people are people. So step one, get your ass kicked. Step two, learn how to run your gun. Um, all right, we covered that. Third thing in a SWAT school. Uh, this is called your uh, blue gun phase or your vanilla room clearing phase. So here's some things that are probably going to be next up on the curriculum. Uh, I can see we got a list here. I'll just give you the list and then we'll talk about each one. You got walking down a hallway. Oh my God, I have to learn how to do that? Yes, yes you do. Uh, navigating intersections in a hallway. So you have a four-way, a T, uh, a left turn, right turn, all that. Uh, you have your clearing vanilla rooms. So just a vanilla room is like a plain room. So just a box. Draw a square on a piece of paper and put a door in the middle of one of those walls. And then you're going to adjust that. So put a door in the middle of the wall, put a door on the left side of the wall, put a door on the right side of the wall, and then maybe do a second door somewhere in the room. Still all vanilla. So there's no bad guys. There's no furniture. It's just you with a blue gun walking in, um, clearing that threshold or walking through a doorway correctly. So walking down a hallway, why would I, as a civilian, how can I benefit from that? Uh, first of all, moving and shooting is very important. Um, I, God, I, I, don't even, I don't know if I'd ever shot a gun at the point when my old man told me this, but he did... He said he was at a agency that did lots of progressive firearm training, so they kind of pushed the envelope. He said there are two things that you want to be doing when you're shoot in a shootout: you want to be moving, and or you want to be behind cover all the time, every time, if you can. So when you're walking down a hallway, you're gonna be moving, and if a threat jumps out, here's how you're gonna benefit from learning how to do this: learning how to shoot and move, learning how to navigate a hallway. Number one, don't freeze. So you don't want to go, oh, bad guy, uh, and then make yourself a target. So you're going to want to move and engage, whether it's forward or into a room or something. Uh, if you're working with two people, so I did an episode on uh, situational awareness for couples. You don't have to be a SWAT mastermind, but it's nice to know that if you're husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend or girlfriend and girlfriend or boyfriend and boyfriend, don't care. Um, if there's maybe two of you running the household or living together, it would be so nice to know that the two of you know how to walk down a hallway 
and not point guns at each other's backs and not have to have a tactical meeting in the middle of a hallway when something goes bump in the night. So you're upstairs, you hear the front door literally get kicked in or the glass smashed in. Man, it'd be great to know that we know how to at least walk to the front door without fucking up. So keeping our muzzle safe, knowing when to do a, uh, a split stack, so one person on the left, one person on the right, knowing when to do a, you know, a single file, knowing when to move, knowing the, the speed at which to move, things like that. Um, civilians can definitely benefit from that. So again, we're responding to the phrase, uh, oh, I wrote it in the title of today's show notes. I don't know if I said it yet. So this episode, we're basically responding to the phrase, oh, there's no reason as a civilian that you and seven of your buddies are going to stack up outside a structure and go clear it. Okay, keeping politics to a minimum. Yeah, there's probably not a reason for that, and that's probably unlikely. So how can a civilian benefit from this training? Okay, doing this with a two or four or eight man stack, learning how to walk down a hallway, definitely applies to you and your significant other in your own home responding to a threat. So just knowing how to walk there, a lot of people can really fuck that up. Navigating intersections. Uh, so you heard me say the phrase tactical meeting. Uh, that can literally be a killer for you um, in a bad way, like get you dead. So when you walk up to a intersection in a hallway, you can turn left or turn right or go straight through or any mixture of the three. Uh, you don't want to have a tactical meeting. You don't want to stop and go time out. Okay, I'll go straight. Oh, you, you go right. Well, no, actually, we'll, no, we'll both look at the hallways. No, 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 opposite way, like across each other. Oh, oh, we're dead. Or, oh, they know we're here. So it's really good to get some basic training going and to know, okay, even if I have to push someone's shoulders the right direction while we walk through, I know how I'm going to handle this intersection. That's great. It's great to have at least tried it. Um, and there are different ways of doing this. There's tons of ways to skin this cat, but knowing what works for you and knowing what your options are is a big help. Uh, walking through doorways. So this is a little shocking to some people. Um, we spent so much time going, nope, doing it wrong, do it again. Nope, doing it wrong, doing it That's not how you clear a threshold. Nope, that's wrong, here's why. You watch me do it, okay. Oh, too fast, nope. Watch your feet, nope, wrong foot went in first. So <laughs> surprisingly, walking through a door, there's a lot to it. Now this is what we call a vanilla door or an open door. Uh, like a wide open door, like the door frame doesn't exist, is often how you start learning that. That's very important um, so that you don't Stick your muzzle through the door and then put the wrong foot in and take a wide turn. So you want to set yourself up for success. Uh, excuse me. I'm so embarrassed. Uh, this is, let me take another sip of my Crown Royal and ginger ale here. All right, walking through doorways. Um, so that's the beginning part. The vanilla would be walking through a wide open door into a plain room. All right, clearing vanilla room. We're going to come back to doorways again. Clearing a vanilla room. So this is some things that are going to be in SWAT school. We're going to talk about how this benefits you as a, as a non-SWAT guy or as a non-law enforcement officer or military guy. Clearing a vanilla room. Um, there's often what you call uh, orders of work or priorities of work or something to that effect. So you go through a doorway. Um, one of the very, very first and very one of the very most important things in SWAT school is learning how to clear your corners. So you go through a door and you look deep all the way into that corner with your eyeballs. You don't just kind of wing it. You look all the way into that corner. Now, if you're working in a two or more man team, hopefully the person behind you clears that other corner. Um, and there's lots of ways to do this. Um, and even as a one man person, you can kind of, you can start to game this and see what the pros and cons are. Even if you have to clear your own house by yourself, at least having some of this training will remind you, well, I might not want to walk straight into the room because if they know I'm coming, where are they probably not going to stand? Well, maybe not right in the middle of the room, especially if they know I'm armed or if they hear me rack my gun, they might tuck into a little corner and go, oh shit, hopefully I can surprise him when he walks in here. So you don't need to be a genius to figure out, oh shit, some of this training could actually really help me, even though I'm not a super duper SWAT operator. So clearing vanilla rooms, you learn your order of work. You go in, you clear your corners, you re-clear. So you go in, let's say I go into a door that's in the middle of a room. So there's just a big square on a piece of paper. There's a door right in the middle of one of those lines. So I walk into the door. Let's say I turn left, I check that corner. I walk a little bit toward, take one or two steps in towards that corner. I start looking all the way towards the right, toward the right, all the way to the right until I clear that corner if I'm by myself. I clear back to the middle. Okay, now what do I need to do? So when you're clearing a vanilla room, 
You would check your corners. You'd get in. You'd dominate your space. You'd re-clear. When you start adding a couple advanced items, one of those is going to be clearing uh, red zones or clearing other other spots that you haven't cleared on your initial search, but we're really talking vanilla rooms just for now. Um, and then you would do whatever follow-on room there is. So let's say there's a second door in the room. You'd start moving towards that door, decide how you're going to walk through it, and walk through that one. So this is all very basic, kind of week one stuff, or day one stuff even. Uh then you're going to move the position of the door, you're going to add follow-on doors, and then you're going to add what we used to call red zones. So like a couch or a desk or a closet in the room. So you'd go in, you'd clear left, clear right, re-clear, dominate your space, decide what you're going to do next. Oh, look, there's a red zone over there. It's a wide closet. Great, we're going to have to handle that now. So you start stacking, stacking responsibilities here, stacking priorities of work or stacking work that you're going to have to look at. Um, how is this going to help you as a civilian? Oh my god, are you kidding me? This one almost almost answers itself. So you're clearing your house, right? Because you walk home to, I don't know, something goes bump in the night, or uh, you walk home and your door's ajar, kind of cracked open a little bit. Well, great. You're not going to, you probably shouldn't clear your master bedroom and then go, yeah, the closet's probably fine, under the bed's probably fine, there's probably no one in the bathroom, no big deal. No, you, you need to clear those things. And you also need to start understanding, and here's where it gets a little tricky, where you start adding lots of variables. You have to understand, which one do I clear, clear first? So here's a phrase you'll, probably, you'll hear often. Um, one is, don't cross a threat to get to a threat. And that often has to do with uh, things like closed doors, open doors, slightly open doors, and locked and unlocked doors. Um, or smaller rooms and things like that, and cabinets. Um, so this world, real-world training is such a confidence booster because even if you do it wrong, at least knowing that you have options, I mean, God, wrong is such a subjective word, but even if you do it maybe in not the most efficient manner, it's good to know the reasons that you're doing certain things. Like you wouldn't go into a room and stand between the closet and the bed to look under the bed and to bend down before you clear the closet. So it might have made sense to go to the far side where if you bend down, you're looking under the bed, but looking towards the closet still. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So you're you're kind of triangulating or looking at as many threats at the same time as you can while you clear one, uh, not exposing your back to other m possible threats. So that question for for the uh, all the vanilla stuff, that question almost answers itself. Uh, let's see, kind of covered that already too. Let's move down the list. All right, prioritizing work. So let's say there's an actual issue whether you're in law enforcement or whether you're not. You're just a regular guy. Uh, prioritizing work. I just mentioned that a little bit. So you go into the room. Let's say you, you go in, you clear your corner, and then hiding behind the couch. Oh, my God, a bad guy. He jumps up. He's got a gun. Well, Joe Home Homeowner, I got to shoot him now. He's got a gun pointed at me. He's in my house. Shouldn't be here. I told him, get out of my house. He didn't listen. Uh, he's got a gun. Great. Bang. He's dead. I think. Right? So here's one of the phrases. Um. And you can change these orders based upon what works for you and what works for your training. But this is a phrase we I heard often in my SWAT training, which was, check the living, check the dead, check the room. Um, you can spend a lot of time and a lot of beer trying to figure out which one to do first. The short answer is, the environment will dictate. So let's say there's two guys. One, one's got a shotgun and the other one doesn't. They both have masks on. They're both in your home. You've verbally warned them, get the fuck out of my house or I'm going to shoot you. They don't leave. You go down. You shoot the guy with the shotgun. He's laying down on the floor, but his buddy is just kind of standing there frozen. Okay, now what are you going to do? So when you go to the local shooting range and you're shooting your paper target, that's not going to help you for this. A lot of a lot of times, even some basic self-defense shooting courses aren't going to help you for this. You've got to be moving. You've got to be using cover. And we're going to talk about the real linchpin for training at the end. Um, the best way to do this, but you can even do this with blue guns and role playing. You can say, bang, bang, fall down. Okay. You're dead. The other guy's not. Well, shit. What's better? F do I go over and check the dead guy first and make sure he's dead? And kind of, if I'm, if, if appropriate, do I handcuff him or detain him or, you know, search him and flip him over and cross his legs and arms? Or do I deal with the living guy? Uh, because if I deal with the living guy first, uh, this is also a phrase we heard a lot. Dead, dead people don't die right. Or people don't die right. So you can shoot a guy twice or three or four times and they lay down on the ground. All of a sudden they get that last stand energy and they're back up and they're shooting you. Maybe while your back is turned to them. So, 
spending the time, spending the energy, doing the research, attending training, repeat training, um, teaching your loved ones how to do this and repping stuff with them, even if with finger guns, you know, fake little handguns, um, can have so much value to a civilian just for that one scenario alone. Well, what do I do now? I shot one guy. Shit. Now I'm frozen. Now they're frozen. Well, is he going to bend down and pick up the gun? What if he does? What do I tell him? Don't. Uh. Do I shoot him? Is he just checking on his buddy? Uh. So getting these reps in will really help. And it'll give you a ton of confidence to go, you know, to start giving task direction. You, back up, back up, back up. Walk towards that wall. Turn away from me. Go. Using the right tone of voice. Getting all that stuff set up. Uh, what do we got next? So check the living, check the room, check the dead. Let's say there's other red zones, right? So you you kill the two guys, but maybe Bubba's waiting out front in the car. Well, well, shit. Do I turn my back to my open front door? Yeah, because what are the chances someone's out there, right? I just I got two guys in here. That's all that could possibly exist. Well, no, you're going to have to re-clear whatever else is in there. You're also going to, this is also a big one, so when you're doing your actual SWAT team training, if you're in a position to be able to do that, you're going to do a lot of multitasking verbally just to talk to your buddies and and explain what you're doing or what you want or what you need. You're also going to be talking maybe on a radio to your team, maybe on a radio to someone outside the team, and maybe on a radio to dispatch. So you're going to be getting uh, input into your ears, input from your environment. So as a civilian, how does this apply? Well, how will it probably not apply? Well, you probably won't be talking on a police radio directing your backup to you. But you might want to have your cell phone in your pocket and call 911. So you might want to be able to multitask with your gun in one hand and your phone in the other so that you don't get shot again. And while you're doing that, you might want to triangulate and give task directions and put yourself in a good position where you're not going to get snuck up on. So huge help attending all this training for a civilian. All right, this one I'm excited about. Uh, A lot of instructors miss this. They just don't teach it. They don't know it exists. Or let's be more, to be more accurate, it's not that they miss it, that they don't teach it at all. It's that they, when they create scenarios, it's, it's tough. It's really tough teaching this. For anyone out there that you've learned from that actually did a good fucking job teaching you CQC or SWAT stuff, let them know, um, it is not easy to teach this. There is so much to unpeel and unravel and so much overlap. This next one, if they can do this right, um, bravo on them. This is so often done incorrectly. So what is it? Okay, knowing which phase of combat you're in. Uh, let's just keep it real simple. Let's say there's three. You have stealth. Uh, you have kind of violence of action. So they... It's kind of loud, and they know you're there, and you're moving with with speed and intent. And then there's other. So there's they don't know you're there. There's they know you're there, and you're coming. You're coming now. And then there's kind of either a mixture or whatever else. When SWAT instructors create a scenario, because there's so much scenario training, or there should be in SWAT, they often say, uh, "Okay, the hallway's yours. You know, these ten rooms, five on the right, five on the left, straight hallway, ready go." Well. Uh, I got a question. What are we doing? They go, it's it's yours. Handle it however you handle it. Well, no. Because if we're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and we bumped up against their boat, they know we're here. So when we jump on board, we probably shouldn't be sneaking around real slow like because they probably fucking know we're here. So uh, let's say you're on on some sort of huge installation. Let's say you're in a huge metropolitan city with a huge-ass bank and there's a bank robbery going on, right? They might know that the police have been called. They might not know where you're at in the building. So that might be a great chance to use some stealth until you make your first contact. So when you're setting up scenario training, you need to know what phase you're in. Do they know we're coming? Has there already been a shooting? So let's say... uh, They put you in one room in the house and say, okay, get to the other room or clear all these rooms or respond to an officer down. Okay, if you're responding to an officer down in a tiny little spot and there's some windows and they can see you outside, you probably just want to fucking hit it hard. You probably don't want to sneak across the street in broad daylight towards the house. All right, beating this dead horse. I've been doing that a lot tonight, but it's important and I'm passionate about it. You need to know what phase you're in. Are you moving slow? Are you taking your time? Are you assessing each threat as you come? 
or are you moving with intent? We can boil it down even more to just those two things. Um, if your instructor has done that correctly for you, bravo on them. Give them a round of applause from me to them. Um, how does that apply as a civilian? Great. Oh my God, I'm so excited anytime I get to do uh, movie references and reference Hollywood and how they do it wrong. <laughs> SWAT training has ruined shooting movies for me. Um, here are the two examples that I've kind of written down for how this applies big time as a civilian, uh, both related to the home. Okay, so number one, like we said earlier, you come home, your front door's wide open. Let's say you're doing really well and you got like a big, like multi-story, like two-story, maybe six-bedroom house, right? You're, you're doing great for yourself. And you're a concealed carry guy, right? You got your gun on you. Let's say your significant other also has a gun on you. If the house is empty and it's just you and your SO, maybe this is a good time to use a little bit of stealth and to methodically clear room by room in a pretty good methodical manner. That that situation would make a lot of sense to use that stealth phase. If it's you and your significant other in the same bedroom in the same bed, and across in the other wing of the house, you have your child sleeping, and across the other wing of the house is kind of right near the front door, and you hear the front door glass smash open in the middle of the night, you want to use your violence of action method. And you want to go, which kind of also has the title, um, uh, objective-oriented or mission-oriented. So your mission isn't to clear the bathroom and then clear the hallway closet and then clear the spare bedroom and then clear the dining room. No, your mission is go to that fucking threat across the house. Maybe as you're walking by some other doors or hallways, you just peek and you go to get to that objective. So two phases, stealth and violence of action or um, objective-driven. So, like I said, there's an other. So, give me a little wiggle room here, please. So, that's so important for a civilian, because what if all you're used to seeing on the TV and in military movies, and if all you've gotten is your basic training at the range, where you show up to an indoor range and you shoot one shot at a piece of paper, this is important to know. You don't, it's not like the movies. You don't get to a door, kick open the door, search the room, go to the next room. That would be stupid if your kids are across the house and there's a burglar breaking through your front door. That would be stupid. So... Know when to go to your threat. Know when to use violence of action. Know when to take your time and assess each threat. Um, that is definitely how that would apply to a civilian. Absolutely. Um, and to be honest, there's not a lot of training that fills that niche gap um, or that fills it well. Uh, that's what she said, right? Um, if you guys know any training that does handle things like that, God, that that's great. Uh, tell everybody about it and tell me about it so I can have them on for an interview. That stuff is so important and so missed. Um, I have a phrase that I use sometime that during a shootout, one of the least important things is the actual shooting. Um, what that would mean is knowing your phase, knowing how to clear, um, knowing how to use verbal, uh, verbal task direction, knowing how to orient yourself, knowing how to triangulate, knowing how to use situational awareness. All this stuff is so important. Moving is sometimes more important than shooting if you move correctly. Um, getting your resources on the way to you. All those things are so important. However, yes, of course, during the shootout, it's also important that you hit where you're aiming at. So while that's important, so much else is also just as important. Um, yes, this definitely applies as a civilian. Uh, Objective-based versus methodical clearing. Man, I keep jumping ahead. We just talked about those. Uh, okay, let's... Good, I was just going to cover that anyways. Man, I'm on fire. All right, let's talk about breaching. So I, I told you we were going to come back to doors. Um, we talked about a vanilla room clearing and just walking through a door at your basic level for your vanilla training. Uh, breaching is when you start having real-life doors that are closed, real-life doors that are closed and locked, and real-life doors that are kind of cracked open. Uh, so what are one of the first things they're probably going to teach you in a SWAT school? Um, don't self-breach if possible. Breaching doesn't necessarily mean breach her up, bring the battering ram. Breaching just means getting through a door. Um, let, let's try and remember that one for the duration of this segment here. Don't self breach if possible, meaning don't open the door yourself. Um, try not, if you're the first person in, the, in a stack or if you're the only person standing at the door um, or you're for one of two people standing at a door, try not to tie yourself up with 
do I grab the handle and then push? I mean, what if it's locked or I mean, how hard do I have to push? What if I have to keep my hand on it? It's like spring loaded door. Uh, don't worry about all that shit. If you can get someone else to open the door for you, do it is one of the first lessons. Uh, knowing on which side of the door to stand, knowing on which side of the door the breacher sh- should stand and which side you should stand. This is also a lot of stuff that's probably really hard to find in a civilian school. I mean, the schools are out there, and please search for them and do a little research, but a lot of people won't cover this stuff. Um, all right, knowing which way to enter based on where the door's located, based on which way the door opens, based on who's breaching. So there's uh, a lot of different ways to do it, but one of the main methods would be if the door, let's say you're, it's a center-fed door, right? So if you draw a big square and a piece of paper, right in the middle of one of those lines, draw the door. So you walk in and there's some room to your left, there's some room to your right, and then the whole room's in front of you. Let's say you're standing outside that room and you're looking at the door, and the door handle is on the left side of the door. And let's say it pushes in towards the room when you open it. So if you're standing on the left of that door and that door starts to open, you still see almost nothing, you see almost nothing, you see almost nothing. Then the door gets like 90 degrees open. Now you can start to see back inside towards the right side of that room. So you're standing outside the door, on the left of it, the door is opening in, the handle's on the left, so the door opens in towards the room, it starts swinging forward to the right, and it opens way wide until you finally start to see the right side of that room. That's not ideal. So let's talk about what the other guy sees, that there's someone on the right side of that door, outside the room. So you have a big square, you draw a door right in the middle of the paper, Now you're standing on the right side of that door outside the room. As that door, as soon as it cracks open one inch, you're already looking deep into that left corner, which is great. So let's say the door swings all the way open. Now you can see almost 90% of the left half of that room before you even go in. Uh, There's two schools of thought. One is you've already cleared almost all of that visually. So percentage-wise, there's a good chance if there's a threat, he's on the right. Because you've already looked at 90% of the left side of that room. One school of thought is, you've already seen that. Go in, go to the right, clear the stuff that you have no idea what's going on. The other school of thought is, well, I cleared 90% of it. should be easy to clear that last 10%. Let me go in, hit that quick 10%, and then my partner will be in behind me, clearing the right side. Two schools of thought. you got to do what works for you, but know why you would do which of those. Here's the other thing. We're going to back up to phases again. If you're in your stealth phase, and probably if you're by yourself, you can swing that door open. If it's a swinging door, if it's not like spring-loaded, you can swing that door open and stand outside that room, and you can take your time. You know, it's up to you whether they know you're there or not. Um, there's a lot of variables, but if you're able to maybe to take your time, you can visually clear 90% of the left side of that room. Then you can slowly start slicing the pie and using good cover to kind of clear as you step around that door frame and you're stepping outside the door. You're still outside the room, but going to the other side of the door. Now you're looking in towards the right and you can clear so much of that without having to enter the room. That's one option as well. Um, so phases are so important and are so seldomly taught correctly or taught at all. Uh, so knowing which way to enter once the door opens. Uh, let's talk about this one. Hard door versus soft door. So let's say the door is kind of near the corner of the room, right? So as soon as you open the door, it only swings 90 degrees, bang, hits a wall. And then you can just look straight down that wall in towards the room. And then the whole rest of the room is off to the side. So they call that a corner-fed door. Um, Why is it good to know that? Well, because if you go in and you think, I'm just going to flip a coin and go right, and you open the door and rush in, turn right, well, you're going to fucking run your forehead into the wall. Some rooms, you can't go in and go left and right. So now you need to know what to do. SWAT training will help you with that. Going to an inside range and shooting a white piece of paper is not going to help you with that. Um, And this could have a very real impact on your life. So hard door versus soft door. What if you start opening that door and there's some resistance? It doesn't open. So you would call that a, uh, a soft door. Like you're pushing it and there's a little springiness to it, which would mean a person or an obstacle, right? Um, A hard door would be the door swings open, boom, hits the backstop. It's a hard door. It's, open like it should be soft door would be i'm pushing the soft door open oh there's some resistance oh shit i I should figure that out so knowing how to handle that is really important because your bad guy doesn't always have to stand in the center of the room doesn't always have to stand far away in the opposite corner sometimes he could be right up against that door or tucked into a corner behind that door 
how does that all apply to civilians? Uh, we've been kind of answering that along the way. Um, hopefully I've been giving you enough good examples of that. All, almost all of this definitely applies. Um, let's talk about our next segment here. What will most likely not apply to you? So I said in the beginning I was going to keep politics mostly out of it. So let's, let's say t- to start this segment, what will not apply to you? To start this segment, we'll say we're not going to reference the reason that the Second Amendment was written. We're not going to reference the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. We're not going to reference the government versus the people. Let's just say none of that applies right now. We're talking most likely scenarios for regular Joes. Okay. Cool. Now that we're in regular Joe mindset for this one, what will most likely not apply to you? I think the phrase that we talked about in the beginning or (laughs) that we missed in the beginning, the phrase is probably correct. There's no way that you and seven of your buddies are going to put your gear on and have to stack up outside a structure and go clear it. Sure, that will probably not apply. You also are probably not going to be wearing 65 pounds of lightweight gear. You're probably not going to be wearing a Kevlar helmet and ceramic or or steel body armor plates. You're probably not going to be wearing combat boots. You're probably not going to be wearing night vision goggles. There's also a good chance you probably won't have a rifle and a pistol on you. You're probably not going to use multiple guns. You're probably not going to have a shotgun where you're going to have to breach the bolt. You're probably not going to have a battering ram where you're going to smash through doors. Let's say it's in your own house, and for some reason or another, you have to get into your children's bedroom, right? Or just a different bedroom in the house. It's locked, and it shouldn't be. And you know there's a fight, and you're coming in, you're getting into that room. Most residential houses in this country, it's not very hard to kick that door wide open and just to push right through that cheap wood door frame with that latch probably pretty easy to kick that open. So those are all the things that probably won't apply. Uh, what else probably won't apply? You probably won't have a radio or a headset or your Peltors with a jacked up radio in it. And you're probably not going to be talking to other team members on a radio. Now, like I said earlier, what will apply is you're probably going to have to multitask with other loved ones that are in your area. Or if you're out with a buddy and you're both concealed carry and you're both relatively trained, you might want to triangulate if there's a shooter in, in a restaurant trying to rob the place. You might want to say, you do this, I'll do that. And then when the shooting starts, you might want to say, hey, go this way, or red zone right, or second shooter that way, and figure out who's moving and who's staying and who's searching. Sure, you're going to want to do some multitasking and verbal uh, communication and verbal task direction. All right. Uh, another note about body armor I just said. Body armor is not dumb for civilians. Uh, I th- we definitely did at least a mini segment or maybe a short article, I can't remember, um, on whether civilians should or shouldn't wear body armor. Um, sh- I'm sure that the news people are going to eat it up and love it. Um, but if something goes bang in the night or crash in the night or smash in the night and it's your home, I don't see it as a, it, it is completely reasonable. Why would you want to potentially get into a gunfight in your own home and not wear some type of armor? And you don't have to have it on a stand like a like a wooden gladiator cross with your armor and your Kevlar helmet. You don't have to have it displayed. But look, just put something... You can get this shit on fucking Amazon or you can Google a relatively good gear company and buy some reasonable plates or a reasonable price. It'll do something for you. And it doesn't have to have stacks of M16 magazines. Rah! Look, just something with some armor. If you're in your own home and you hear people... This hap- Look, this happens in real life. There's no debate. If you hear boom, 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 and your wall starts shaking because someone's trying to actively kick in your front door, that would be a completely fucking reasonable time to throw your body armor on and grab, grab your fucking Glock or your shotgun or maybe both. If you have a quick pancake holster, bang, pop it in your jeans belt. Some stuff like that we could talk more about, but that is completely fucking reasonable. Why on earth... Would you want to be outgunned and underarmored for a situation like that? So, no. You'll probably not be wearing 65 pounds of lightweight gear with night vision goggles and radios and all that crap. But yes, it would be good to know how to operate when you're wearing armor. It would be good to know how to multitask. And there's, sure, there's the occasion when you might want to transition weapons. Sure. Uh, what else won't apply to you? Yeah, you probably won't be doing this in a four-man squad. I think it's completely reasonable that some two-man tactics will apply. Even if the other person isn't highly trained, you can do some 
minimal training at home, even without bullets, to, just to get someone thinking about the concepts. Like I said earlier, even if you have to steer them, like, okay, get your gun out. I got my gun out. Just follow me. And we're walking. And I got my hand on your shoulder. And I go, nope, back up. I got this. And just pull them back and take that stairwell. Yes, completely reasonable that two-man tactics will apply, even if you have to teach it on the fly. Or just direct it on the fly. Yes, completely reasonable. But I think, likely, no, you and seven of your buddies won't be geared up outside a structure to clear it. Uh, the methodical clear, like I said earlier, you probably will not be methodically clearing a school bus. You probably won't be methodically clearing an airplane. You probably won't be methodically clearing a big-ass warehouse with six or eight of your buddies. Sure, very unlikely. So SWAT training for that, probably useless. But that wealth of stuff that we covered already, just the vanilla basics, can give you so much confidence to know, well, I got to go from here to there. I got to cover this hallway. I got to go into that room. I got to clear that corner. Okay, what work's important now? Well, there's no bad guys in here, and we checked all the red zones. Great, moving on, next. That takes so much of the guesswork out. So instead of going, oh, sh shit, should I, should I search that room? Uh, let me peek my head in. Uh, uh, wait, no, shit, I got to go all the way in. Well, ah, uh, fuck learning that rhythm or that dance. Sometimes they refer to it as a dance. It's like a beautiful ballet of people going in, people going out, people looking left and right. Some short, effective communication, moving on to the next problem. It's, it's really cool to watch from above just to see people flow in and flow out. You get a good flow going. That can be so important. Um, Two-man, probably your limit. For people that aren't in law enforcement, aren't in the military, um, and that SWAT stuff was designed for multiple people to do at the same time. Um, our training was you never go anywhere with one man. There's no such thing as a one man stack. You just don't do it. Uh, you wait till you have another person and then you go. Um, but even for one man, uh, like I said, it's good to know to clear your corners. It's good to know that there's a priority of work. It's good to know that if there's a live guy and a dead guy and areas you haven't checked yet, which one do I start picking apart first? Yes, that's a and SWAT stuff is designed for that to show you how to handle those priorities of work. So hopefully you're still with me and I haven't beaten the shit out of those dead horses throughout the episode. But uh, last segment here, the ultimate litmus test. If I lit, litmus test to am I able? Here's the quote. Here's the test to solve this quote. Am I able to smartly engage an armed enemy? The test for that is force on force. Usually that's uh, simunitions or some other type of training round. Uh, by the way, I would never deal with a company called Ultimate Training Munitions. Um, I'd be more than happy to say how awesome simunitions are forever. I've used them a lot in the past. They're actually the only brand I've used. Um, but I've had absolutely fantastic things to say about that company and that product. Nothing negative, period. Um, so let's say you're doing some force on force training. That is the answer to... Am I, smart, am I able to smartly engage an armed enemy? Now you'll notice in that quote, I didn't say, am I ready to engage an enemy? I didn't say, will I win this gunfight? I said, how do I know if I'm able to smartly engage an armed enemy? Well, you'll know that if you've attended some, some type of SWAT or CQC training. And you'll know that if you've put it to the test with some basic, basic simunitions, force on force. Simunitions or other training around force on force. So, what does that do for you? Well, number one, uh, one of the most common problems with training is you learn how to run your gun, you learn how to move and shoot, all for a stationary paper target that's not behind cover, or you're not behind cover, or that doesn't shoot back. Great. Force on Force will show you a moving defender and a moving attacker, attacker in a gunfight. That's huge. You do not want the first time that this happens to be in real life. Uh, I'd love to see some stats on it, but there has got to be just a wealth of people out there that have never done Force on Force training, that have only shot paper targets, and then all of a sudden, bang, they're in a real life shootout. I would love to hear from some of those people and see just this angle on it of oh my God, he was moving and I was moving. Uh, and what happens in their brains? God, that's amazing. Um, force on force will we'll take that right out of, the, right out of your concern area because you'll already be, you'll know, oh, shootouts are, I shoot, they shoot, we both move and we both use cover. Uh, so force on force and training, uh, training munitions are 
the ultimate test to that. They will let you know if you're smartly able to engage an enemy. Doesn't mean you'll win. Doesn't mean you're ready, because I don't think anyone's ever ready. But am I smartly able to do this? Am I able to make smart decisions, decisions that I make for a reason, decisions that I'm informed about, when to use cover, when to move, um, how to prioritize my work, because a shootout isn't always one person versus the other person, oh, bang, they're dead, game over. There's so much more before, during, and after that. All right, understanding the phase of combat. Force on Force will tell you that. Now, of course, it's really tough to set up a training scenario and say, oh, there's not going to be a shootout. Well, yeah, you know there's going to be a shootout. You're both wearing fucking protective gear and you have training guns. There's going to be a shootout. But there are ways you can set it up to say, well, you don't know when the other guys are coming in. So it could be 60 seconds, could be 10 minutes, could be 30 minutes. There's some ways you can kind of adjust that variable. Yeah, they're going to know you're coming in, but they might not know from which direction, and they might not know when. Uh, So understanding the phase of combat, knowing when to hit aggressively and to move, 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 to advance, to be violent, to bang, take the fight to them. There's also a time to methodically clear a room and to say, okay, room one, clear, moving. Room two, clear. Okay, room three, I got one guy without a gun. He's an unknown. Okay, moving. And there might never be a shooter. Yeah, there might be a good time to methodically clear and figure out what you've got going on in the whole structure. Okay, Um, so segment four, the ultimate litmus test to am I able to smartly engage? So knowing what phase you're in, some munitions or training munitions will, and force on force will tell you that. They'll get you at least to understand that you know the difference between phases of combat. Oh, I'm out of breath, but that's because I I like this topic. I've wanted to do this show for such a long time. I'm glad I'm finally knocking it out. Uh, Okay, this one's really good. The ridiculous and the real applicable heart rate increase. Uh, Some training instructors will do things like making you do push-ups or making you do sprints or uh, making you hit a punching bag and then go shoot. Yes, uh, getting your heart rate up is a good way to do some stress inoculation to get you training under stress. Uh, making a threat of physical fitness. If you fail, yeah, that's one way to do stress. Uh, I have also seen some documentation that while those help, they are not a stand-in for combat heart rate and combat stress. They're a type of stress, but they don't necessarily match up. Um, That might have been by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman um, through some of his lectures or his books that he's written. I think that might be where it came from. He talks about stress inoculation a lot. That might have been him. Either way, I have seen um, some studies that show that just getting your heart rate up through a method is not the same feeling of combat. So here's something that Force on Force will do for you. Um, I did one training scenario once where um, all of them, my heart rate goes up a little bit before because you know you're walking into a shootout. Um, But this one stands out for me a lot. It's a, oh my God, a wealth of just mental experience. Uh, Having a shooter even with just a pistol, even with just one shooter, and taking 10 or 20 people and putting them in a training structure and saying, none of you have guns. Go hide. The shooter's coming in in two minutes. Well, yeah, doing force on force and knowing that you can shoot a guy that might have a gun or a knife, that's one thing. But, And I, I was very well-versed in simunitions. I was very healthy. I was very fit. I was very confident. I was definitely a sharp, active shooter guy. Uh, that scared the piss out of me. I knew it was training. I knew I might not get shot at all, and if I did, it would be once or twice, and I'd, you know, play dead. But, oh my god, my my heart was out of control. It, like, it's, I'm not afraid to tell you guys. This is important for you guys to hear. I'm not embarrassed. I was fuck. I almost pissed myself. My heart was like, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do some martial arts on him, or I'll wait till he walks in the door, and then I'll grab the gun, or I'll surprise him. I was like, Fuck, I need a better hiding space. Shit, shit, shit. I definitely recommend you guys try that. Um, Knowing that you're at such a disadvantage. um, Oh my god, a psychological impact. I'll take with me forever. That was so, so uh, enlightening. Highly recommend you do that. Um, Highly recommend it. Uh, So the ridiculous and real applicable heart rate increase from force on force training is so helpful. Um, and stress, stress inoculation is a big deal. The more you can put yourself under that stress, the better it's going to be in combat. So running your next, uh, next thing, the ultimate litmus test to, am I able to smartly engage an armed enemy? 
going force on force when the other guy shoots back. And I did have a... Uh, it's been several years since I've done this ammunition stuff, um, trying to plan to go back and get certified. Um, it's been a few years. From what I remember, simunitions, because of the paint going through the gun, uh, had, I'm sure because of maybe the type of ammo, uh, did have quite a few jams, which was great. Uh, it was awesome being in a shootout and advancing down a hallway and seeing that bad guy and bringing my sights up and going, bang, bang, click, oh, shit, bam, 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 okay, guns up, bang, bang, and handling that without that pause and without it ruining my game plan and without me kind of getting weak in the knees and going, uh, what do I do? So knowing how to run your gun, force on force training, simunitions training will let you know if you're able to smartly engage somebody by letting you know if you're able to run your gun when it misfires under stress. Uh, and I kind of mentioned it already, the real use of cover, the real use of cover. Um, I am so not impressed with people that are quote unquote, you know, expert shooter, sharp shooter for their basic military qualification. We often didn't even use barricades. We're supposed to shoot from the left of the barricade, shoot from the right of the barricade. No one judged how well you did. No one judged if your knee was sticking out. They just needed you to lean left and lean right. And often we didn't even use barricades. They said, just pretend, just kind of stand there and kind of lean leftish and lean rightish, even though there's no barricade. Okay, that's not acceptable. Force on force will let you know if you're using cover correctly or not. Um, the only thing... One of the downsides to force on force with simunitions rounds is that it's hard to differentiate between cover and concealment because the paint bullets will be stopped by, you know, some some thick screening or a, a piece of glass will stop them. So a real bullet, yes, would go right through a regular piece of plain old door door glass on your front door. Um, simunitions, glass will stop almost all of them and probably should. Um so, so that's a little misleading, but hopefully some common sense will help with that. Uh, but besides that, it will at least teach you to use some form of cover, even if it's not the most effective cover. You will probably not want to get shot a ton of times from the bad guys, or if you're a bad guy and someone else is a good guy, that's the other way that simunitions is really going to help you, or force on force is really going to help. So you be the guy that kicks in the front door, when the husband and wife are back there and, you know, dad's got a gun, you be that guy and watch how they act. That is also a huge wealth of information that I'm so thankful I got. So when I played bad guy for the SWAT teams, it was great going, okay, number one, went in, went left. Number two, went in, went left. Okay, well, I'm just going to shoot both of them in the back. Um, that was a huge benefit is seeing how the good guys are going to do it when you're the bad guy. Uh, good guy, bad guy. Um, let's just, I don't know shooter number one, shooter two, whatever phrases you want to use. Um, force on force, team A, team B. All really the same for this podcast. Just person with a gun versus person with a gun or other weapon. So that's the test. So to know if you're able to smartly engage, you should probably know if you're able to use cover, if you're able to handle your heart rate being up, if you're able to run your gun correctly when it misfires. Um... If you're able to understand the phases of combat, if you're going to go, you know, mission directed, or if you're going to go methodical room clearing, uh, knowing to, how to navigate a hallway, how to self breach, or how to get someone else to breach, which side of the door to stand on, you don't have to be a super duper expert, but understanding the basic principles behind a lot of that stuff will take so much of the guesswork out of a real life encounter, and it'll take so much of the thinking out of your real life encounter that it'll, it'll allow you to focus on things that are much more important. Like, what am I looking at? What do I do next? Instead of how do I do look and how do I do next? So you'll know how to get through the doors. You'll know which way they open. You'll know how to put yourself on the best side. Uh, and even if you fuck up, you'll know how to recover and you'll know why you fucked up and you can process and move on. <sighs> um, I love the audience interaction. Thank you so much for sticking around. Um, if you have comments, Discord, I'm on 24-7. The link is in today's show notes. Instagram, I'm pretty active on. If you're checking this out on YouTube for some reason, I don't get to those comments all the time. Um, occasionally, I will, but your best bet's just to contact me through email or Discord or Instagram. Again, my email is uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. There's also an email form on my website. Just click contact. Again, thanks so much for checking us out. I hope to see you on the next one. If you found some value in today's show... Please subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. And it's also a big help if you share this with some of your friends who might also find value in this. 
Hope to see you on the next one. I'm out.